Curling fans, as America's best curling teams prepare to compete on the world stage, you've come to the one place with everything you need involving USA Curling. It's the Extra Extra In podcast with Price Atkinson. Get ready for everything that you need to know. News, interviews, points of view, anything involving Team USA forming and the 2018 Winter Olympics in South Korea for Team USA Curling is found here. It's the Extra Extra In podcast with Price Atkinson and the 12th In Sports Network crew powered by Isagenics. Welcome in to episode three of the Extra Extra In podcast here with the 12th In Sports Network, powered by Isagenics, Price Atkinson, and my man Joe Calabrese from 12th In Sports Network. Joe, what's happening today? Excited to do this again. Oh man, it's it's just <clears throat> the greatest thing to do <laughs> is to meet up with you each week and talk a little bit of curling and uh, you know maybe catch up a little bit of on football, but uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited. This week's episode is a really good one. We've got a great interview, and then we've got a, a roundtable discussion that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, we've got Greg Persinger and Brady Clark from Team Clark in our interview, and then uh, we're going to be talking with Sean Murray, a TESN commentator, and we're going to be talking about all things HPP in relationship to what it's like to uh, be outside the HPP and what, and what that means in terms of the Olympic trials coming up in November. Yeah, and Brady Clark and Greg Persinger, certainly those guys. Team Clark, uh, the, along with Colin Huffman and Phil Tilker, kind of the black sheep, so to speak, that will be at the trials because of the seven teams. Uh, they are the one and only outside of the high-performance program, so that we know. And so a really interesting and insightful, I thought a very insightful conversation uh, and interview that Brady and, and Greg gave us uh, in Omaha just a couple weeks ago and Brady I gotta tell you seeing him for the first time since nationals in February he's the guy that looks really really good and in some really good shape Joe yeah absolutely uh you know his mindset and the team's mindset you're gonna really uh get a little bit of uh, some insight into what they're thinking about as they prepare for the probably the most critical two months of their curling careers and uh and it's just it's a it's a just a peek inside what it really takes to to pull this off um, when you're outside the system. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, we'll talk with Sean Murray in the final segment. You know, as you mentioned, our roundtable segment uh, as we'll get into you know a, a myriad of topics, but a lot of news that we'll kind of touch on then. But we'll touch on it just real quick out of the gate now. You know, the World Curling Congress was held this past uh, this past week and weekend. And some interesting news and kind of changes coming out of that, Joe, that, that we found out. I think some good, maybe some not so good. I, I think we'll, we'll definitely dive into it, but, but no doubt about it, some real interesting news coming out of Slovenia. Yeah, you know, we've got uh, some format changes, some rules changes, and, and even a new uh, series of events to talk about. And, you know, it seems as if every year now there's some major – uh, rules change that comes down that really can change the sport to some degree and and I and we'll have to talk with Sean is this going to be for the better or is it going to be uh, just another change yeah no doubt about it we got a great contest this week for you we'll tell you a lot more about that and certainly our sponsors we can't do it without them but where can you speaking of sponsors uh, we can't thank uh, everybody enough for you know the sponsors and a lot of the feedback that we've got Joe after the first two episodes where we'll tell you here in a second where to get it but just Really, really appreciate all the feedback you've gotten, I've gotten on Twitter, Facebook, uh, people emailing. Uh, I think people are enjoying this thing, and I think they might be enjoying it half as much as you and I do, getting to talk together, you know, get together every single week to talk some curling like this. Yeah, you know, it's uh, a new format, I think, you know, talking U.S. curling every single week uh, during the season. I think people are really enjoying it, and then I know people are sharing it on uh, social media, and that make, means uh, a great deal, great deal to us. Um, get the message out, make those numbers grow, uh, and and build that excitement for the Olympic trials and for the Olympics in in uh, February. Yeah, no doubt about it. We're going to have a lot of fun in Omaha, but uh, speaking of having fun, we're going to do that here coming up in the next segment when we talk with Brady Clark and Greg Persinger. But first, where can you get the 12th In Sports Network podcast? Joe, it's real easy. As we tell everybody every week, the Apple Podcast app on your smartphone, just go search the extra, extra in. It's real easy to get. You know, iTunes on your desktop. Uh, you can get us on Google. Google Play, Stitcher, and without a doubt, our homepage, tesn.us forward slash podcast, tesn forward slash 
or dot us forward slash podcast. You can listen to it right there. Sign up uh, with the widget to get in the weekly contest. It's real easy to listen to every single week. And what we tell everybody also: subscribe, rate, and share. Yeah, you know those are the most important things. If you're going to tell people about the podcast, you got to subscribe. You got to share. You got to let people know what it's all about. No doubt about it. And what we're all about is having some fun and talking USA curling. And that's what we're going to do here coming up in the next segment with Team Clark's Brady Clark and Greg Persinger. You won't want to miss that conversation coming up in the next segment. Bryce Atkinson and Joe Calabrese will be right back here on the Extra Extra In podcast, the 12th In Sports Network, powered by Isagenix. You try different weight loss programs and are still looking for results. I was too until I found Isagenix, and it didn't take long before I started getting the results that I wanted. Isagenix is a complete 9 day or 30 day weight loss energy performance and health aging program. With over 550,000 customers in seven countries, Isagenix's science backed ingredients are, and products are rigorously tested for safety and will help boost your weight loss efforts by gently cleansing and nourishing your body. Isagenix's cleansing and fat burning system has helped me relieve daily stress and given me even more energy to play with my kids from sun up to sun down. Every day and every week, I'm coming across and meeting a friend of mine that is also an Isagenix customer. My personal Isagenix associate, Sarah Schuster, helped me take control of my health and most importantly, my life. Sarah walked me through the entire process, answered every question, and most importantly, serves as my personal daily cheerleader. And she can do the same and more for you. Give Sarah a call with the keyword curling at 218-391-1566 and she'll waive your one-year membership fee. Stop making excuses and start taking control. Let Sarah get you started on a healthier life at 218-391-1566. Isagenix did it for me, and it can do it for you. Welcome back into the Extra Extra In podcast here. So we're going to talk with members of Team Clark. Got Brady Clark and Greg Persinger here. Guys, it's almost here. Olympic trials. How's it feel? Well, it's exciting. It's been a lot of work that's gone into it, years of uh, dedication. And we're, I'm excited to get out there and perform and uh, looking forward to seeing what happens on the ice. Yeah, been training hard all summer. And ice is great out there right now. We just practice. Really nice. Yeah, so obviously this is not one of the high-performance teams. All right, let's go ahead and just put the cards on the table. We know that uh, clearly some controversy, non-controversy, you guys being here, I'll say it. I personally, there's no doubt about it. You guys firmly belong to be in Omaha competing in trials here in about two months in November. What was the relief like when you guys got the call, Greg and Brady? You know, we actually got an email, and uh, it was like an overwhelming sense of relief. It wasn't even excitement. It was just like relief. Like, you know what? We we felt we earned it. Mm -hmm. I really believe that we earned it. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, thankful to be here. Um, I'm thankful that the votes, that it got tallied up. I'm sorry that it was votes, but regardless, uh, that's the way it was. And so, yeah, we were kind of, we were planning like we were going to be in, even though, you know, we had had to start start our plan before we even knew we were going to get picked so yeah it was a big relief when it did happen when you guys got the email as it was not a phone call uh the email who were the first people that you told did you i mean I, right away i i i sent it to the team i yeah. you know like congratulations to the team and um you know i ran to see my girlfriend and called my parents and my brother yep yeah for me it's obviously my wife first but then my dad and my yeah. So coming off, you know, nationals, I know in your hometown and where you guys, you know, compete out of and it, it, disappointing. I, I mean, it, it was a disappointing week for you guys. I don't think there's any other way to sugarcoat it. But, you know, to make it into trials, there was some doubt what, thrown in because of what happened in nationals. I mean, it's a huge sense of relief that we can not play our best, but we still get a shot to come here and be the best. 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We say what happened in Nationals, but the reality is that we were first place in 2016. We won the Nationals. Right. And we were third uh, the next year. So yep. the only team that was really above us when you compare Nationals results was Schuster's team. Yep. And they did really well and, you know, proud of them. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was it was rough to lose in the in the semifinals. Um, right. And I put a lot of blame. I put the blame on myself because I, I had some distractions going on in my life, and I know it impacted the mm-hmm. team. So... Uh, my life's straightened out, and everybody has. This team has been working as hard as any team I've ever mm-hmm. been with uh, this last couple of years, and, and especially this last summer. It was so great. The communication's been there. We've got a fantastic coach on board, and um, we are just excited to get out there. Yeah, I think you know. Obviously, disappointed after last nationals, but it might you know be making us work that much harder. Right. You know, this year not you know coming in and winning again. You know, this year we know we got to work a lot harder to make sure. Yeah. But we're going to have a really good chance to win these open trials. Yeah, no doubt, guys. Yeah, my life's in order, and uh, I'm, I'm super happy. It's just uh, it's great to be out there and, you know, excited to be curling, but got my personal life in order, and so I'm, I think it's going to be a fun year. Yeah, no doubt about it. As we're talking with Brady Clark and Greg Persinger, certainly their other team comprised of Phil Tilker and Colin Huffman, and you you alluded to it. You, both of you guys talk about it, but a new coach – I'm talking with you earlier. Somebody you guys are really excited about to have working with you all. Yeah, we've got Bill Shearhart. He's one of the best. I would say he's one of the best three coaches in the world. Uh, we've had Ken Trask be our coach for many years, and Ken's a fantastic mm-hmm. coach. Um, but Bill's got a lot of the soft side of the game and, uh, you know, helping us on communication and a lot of other aspects and, and really just help the team to, yeah. uh, I think, just take it to another level. Right. What What is it, you know, for you guys, you know, especially you, Greg, playing with Brady? I mean, you've been with Brady a little while. What what is it you that you like playing? You know, what's it like playing with Brady? First of all, and you know the connection you guys have. No, it's kind of crazy. We've actually curled together a lot over the years. Uh, we actually curled together in juniors at one point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've just been friends through most of these years, and you know haven't haven't been able to play with each other, each other on a few occasions. And then these past you know few years here, been able to play with each other. It's been, it's been really nice. So, go ahead, Brady. Sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, 2013, when we won the Nationals that year, we added Greg as our fifth. We couldn't mm-hmm. think of a better fifth that could be out there. We had a little controversy with having to replace our fifth that year. Yep. Um, but, you know, in, in regards to it, in the fact that we were kind of, our hand was forced with replacing um, Steve, you know, Greg, there was no one else in the country that we wanted on this team more, and Greg came in, and he was fantastic matching rocks and just being a team player and mm-hmm. supporting us. And so then the following year, you know, we, uh, you know, after that following year, um, then we picked up Greg and yep. we've been, ha- had him on our team since. So, you know, now this is obviously you guys find out you go into trials, you can make, you make it, you get it official. What was the summer like for you all? You know, once you found out, I mean, like Greg said, you didn't, you, pre- you were preparing as if you were going, there was no reason not to, but once you found out and it was set in stone, you were obviously preparing anyway. What was the summer like for you guys? Because I mean, Maybe it was what summer? It's been what summer? Yeah. It, it, it's it's not, you know, we talk about having an off season. And you know, when you're trying to make the Olympics now, you don't really have an off season. Yeah. You know, it's, it's every day you're, you're working on something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, normally for me, summertime in Alaska, I mean, it's all about going fishing and, you know, doing outdoor stuff, going to the lake, whatnot. Um, not a lot of that happened this summer. Yeah. Uh, you know, just going to the gym and, you know, we've gone out. To Minneapolis, I've been down in Phoenix on the ice, I've been in Seattle. I mean, it's just you know, get on the ice as much as possible and in the gym as much as possible. Yeah, you've had a you had a very busy championship season in spring and certainly summer. I want to ask you about that in a few minutes, but you know, being outside and this is a loaded question to a degree, but being outside the high performance program, it, it obviously has some distinct advantages, you know, but it also has some obviously very distinct disadvantage. Funding, you know, opportunity at the top of the list, but what has Team Clark done to counter some of those obstacles, you know, to get where you are right now? Well, uh, I mean, we've had to get together a lot of sponsors in order mm-hmm. to help us out as far as uh, funding. We have some good sponsors. I don't know if I should mention them all on this. What do you, you can yeah. fire away. Uh, so we've got PocketSkip.com. That's our, that's our biggest sponsor. Uh, Denali Brewing Company's sponsor of ours. Uh, Harbor Capital Management. We've got Avalon Massage. You know, we've had TESN on for years this year. You know, 
they've taken a step back, but these guys have been supportive throughout. I mean, they just have been fantastic. Yeah. Um, we've got Sixero Photography that's coming on uh, this year, and uh, you know we've got Hardline Perling Supplies, of course, has been sponsoring us, and then Dynasty, you know, mm-hmm. apparel. So those are our sponsors, and uh, you know we're we're thankful for all of them. They're making this making this possible, or making it a lot certainly a lot easy. Yeah. You know, easier for us. I'd say between that and bringing on Bill Shearhart was huge yeah. as far as us, you know, helping us throughout the training and getting a program ready to train throughout the summer. Yeah, when you say overcoming the obstacles, you know, the financial piece is, is important, but then there's right. the other side of how are you going to have high performance training? How are you going to have a coach that, you know, is, is hopefully feeding the information, the level of information? Yeah. So Bill Shearhart used to be the National Canadian Training Center director, and he's still been involved and so we're 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 thankful to have him supporting our team and working with us um we've we've developed a program that is really just our own high performance program and i'd say we're flying under the radar you know we're we're, we've been working very hard quietly and you know we'll we'll see what happens yeah we haven't been posting any videos you know on twitter or (laughs) facebook or anything you know working out but (laughs) definitely flying under the radar I think you like. I think you guys really like it that way. I mean, I get this sense with the smiles that you guys like being counted out in a lot of way. You know, I mean, it, being outside the program, you know, we applied for the program and you know we were turned down, and we we definitely applied saying, hey, we want to be in as a as a team, and so yep. you know, and the program is individual athletes, so you know that's that's fair. You know, that that may be the why we weren't in. Maybe maybe there's other reasons, but it's worked out for us, and you know, I feel like we've had a ton of support. Uh, around our club has been phenomenal across the west coast I, I really it's been across the country i just yeah. feel like a lot of people are behind us and they they know that we're working our tails off and and so are the guys in the high performance program so um but we've got our own coach we've got our own we've been able to form our own teammates that are our friends mm-hmm. and i think there's some real advantages so there's some disadvantages maybe we don't have the the olympic training center act you know access or maybe we don't have you know nutritionists and sports psychologists mm-hmm. but bill is really our sports psychologist as well so yeah. We really do have that, even though maybe not form- formally. Yeah, and, and you mentioned team, Greg. Two guys, obviously not in the room, but just clearly integral parts of, of who Team Clark is. You know, Colin Huffman and Phil Tilker. Just oh, talk about those two guys for sure. I mean, Colin, you know, being a physical specimen that he is, uh, a beast, a beast. Uh, he he's also helped us quite a bit with our nutrition side and workouts and mm-hmm. whatnot, and even the mental side of the game. We've all been working together on that. And then Philip Tilker, uh, you know, he has an interesting personality, but he's a great guy. So, uh, Brady probably say more. What, what did Phil Tilker, one of the most interesting personalities in the sport of curling, <laughs> at least here in the United States, I can say that, Brady, right? No, oh, definitely. <laughs> Phil, Phil's a phenomenal he's person, awesome. and so he's is awesome. Colin. I mean, we, we have a really fun team. We have a good time. I mean, we're friends. Yeah. And, you know, the, these guys... I can't say enough good things yeah. about them. They're, uh, you know, each each player brings their own things to the team, um, but it's just a cohesive unit. That even when we have a little thing, we we're, we're able to work it out quickly. And especially, you know, Bills Bills helped us improve it that even even more. Yeah, as we talk with Greg Persinger and Brady Clark from Team Clark, Greg, I, there's no doubt we got to ask you about this. I mean, you had a crazy successful season last year, meddling at what three national championship level events. What would it mean to kind of cap off, granted it's technically a new year, but what would it mean to cap the kind of year off that you had by winning the Olympic trials? Yeah, that's funny. I, I never even really thought about it that way, you know. Um, I mean, I guess it is still in the same year, but mm-hmm. um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it'd be awesome to, to win, win the trials, obviously. It's been a dream for yeah. forever. Uh, so last season was a lot of fun. I It was kind of interesting. I didn't plan on playing like a mixed and my wife wanted to play so, so yeah you know you play right and then uh, <laughs> it, and then the club nationals was at my home club so that was that was really just mm-hmm. just a good time playing with the guys i play with on the night and you know we just had a good time yeah how special was that i mean you win club nationals in fairbanks your home club is the skip what your brother is the you know the vice skip to win nationals with your brother right i mean how how yeah. You know, I uh, unfortunately I don't look at club nationals as highly as maybe I should. Sure, but being but, being with a club team, uh, you know, not it's not like we have put together some crazy national team other than you know myself playing at right. nationals. But you know, being able to do it with my brother and actually one of my best friends, Jason Austinus, and mm-hmm. then Colin's dad, Dave Hoffman, great guy. Uh, 
no, it was, it was a great experience. I'm just glad I got to be able to do it with him because my brother, is, he's, a, he's a great curler, but mm-hmm. he just uh, hasn't had the, you know, time or, you know, maybe wherewithal to be able to try to <clears throat> play it at higher levels. Yeah. So. It, it, living still in Alaska, I mean, I think it's still cool. I, I still don't understand how you don't gain weight owning a cold soap creamery. That you, you're the, you, I would think your physical fitness routine has got to be at a level unlike anybody else on the team. Now, Colin Huffman is in some damn good shape. I do know that. I don't really eat it very much at all. It's not like if you own or work at a McDonald's, you don't touch it. Yeah. No, I hear you. I, when we first took over Cold Stone Creamery in our first store, I think I gained about 20 pounds. So yeah. uh, I learned really quick that you can't eat ice cream all day. <laughs> tough, tough living in Alaska still, though? I mean, is it, you know, is your, you know, tra- traveling more than your, probably uh, your teammates you are? Know, is it, does it, are there, are there challenges? There, there are definitely challenges. It's, it's it sucks not being able to practice with the team as much as I would like, mm-hmm. um, but I've actually overcome you know a lot of the things as far as travel is concerned. I just I just travel, take an extra day, let stay a night in Seattle, mm-hmm. you know, and then um, ice. I mean, we have we have a great curling club, so that works out all right. We have good ice, uh, good ice makers, yeah, and. A, club that backs me so it's really nice yeah absolutely all right brady uh one more for you uh, you know the trial schedule is not going to be it's packed i mean we're sitting here in mid-september we basically got two more months until the trials in omaha in november but this it's not it's going to be as crowded in terms of a schedule of playing you know two three games a day might be have two i mean trials is going to be a lot more spread out what does that do does that just does that help maybe you battle some back problems in the past is maybe a little bit lighter schedule does that play into your favor i think it does play in my favor but i tell you what this this summer with all the work that i've done and you know i had a little uh heart related issue uh this last summer got that that result okay. uh, with my head my heart clicking up to about 220 Ooh. beats per minute wouldn't come out of the rhythm Ooh. got that fixed um i've dropped you know over 30 pounds and i i'm in i'm in as good a shape as i was in college so i i feel really wow. good and I haven't had it. I haven't. I better knock on wood. I haven't yeah. been having any pain this summer. And he's not walking around like an old man. <laughs> yeah, you'll notice I'm not limping. It's it's phenomenal. I get off the ice and and there's no yeah. shooting pain going down in my toes. So he's looking sharp, Greg. I mean, he's hanging yeah, with you and Colin in the gym on the yeah, treadmill and he's stuff. Looking right? good. He's looking good. All right, as we get ready to turn the page and you know close up shop here with Brady and Greg, uh, you know, talk to us about. The fall schedule and what you guys were, what how you'll be competing, where you'll be competing, just some of the spiels you guys have on the weekends and with a lot of training sessions. Yeah, we start off with, with, with training here, and we're gonna next weekend we'll be out in Oakville, Ontario for okay. uh, for an event, so Stu Cells, I believe, and then the following weekend is another Oakville event. We're taking a couple weekends off in September um, okay. after that because we have three weekends in a row. Uh, then we go to Saskatoon, uh, followed by St. Paul. And then a training weekend in Seattle with uh, with our coach and the team, and then we've got a weekend off. We go out to Sarnia, Ontario, mm-hmm. a weekend off, and guess what? It's November 11th, and it's the Olympic trials time. <laughs> well, look, it's from all of us at, at TSN and, and certainly the Extra Extra Podcast, myself, uh, guys, best of luck to you. I hope you guys come to Omaha and absolutely oh, give them hell for more than anything. I know it's going to be a fun week of curling. Yeah. Should be great. All We're right. excited. And thank you so much. All the best. All the best, Greg Persinger and Brady Clark. Appreciate them joining us. We'll be right back here on the Extra Extra End. Dynasty Apparel was created and built by curlers. They have firsthand experience and unique insight on how apparel should be designed and created for optimal game performance. Thanks to Dynasty Curling, we have a great giveaway for our listeners. This week, we're going to give you the chance to win a Dynasty Curling hat. To enter, go to our website at www.tesn.us slash podcast using the widget in the upper right-hand corner of the page. We'll announce the winner next week. And Price, you're a winner too. Dynasty is where TESN buys their curling gear, and Price, because the Panthers beat the Bills, you're getting your very own TESN curling jersey. Price, I also want to let, mention that last week's winner of the Monica Walker signed Curling Night in America jacket is TJ Kasser, or a peel of shame for those of you who may know him on Twitter. Congrats to TJ, and remember, each week's contest is a brand new chance to win. You must enter each week for your chance to win that week's prize. Entries do not carry over, so to win, remember to go to tesn.us slash podcast and click that win widget in the upper right-hand part of the page.
Welcome back into the Extra Extra and Podcast. Bryce Atkinson, Joe Calabrese, and now our man, the Angry Bird himself, our weekly roundtable. And this week we are joined by the man, Sean Murray, from the Twin Cities. What's happening, Sean? How's it going? Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Been too long, right, Joe? Thanks a lot for coming, Sean. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thanks for coming, Sean. Well, yeah, let's that, that, that'd be here. Go ahead. Yeah, let's get into it. Uh, so we talked to Brady Clark and uh, Greg Persinger, caught up with them just a couple weeks ago in Omaha. So uh, really kind of diving into it this week, guys, and, and really let's dive into it this way is, you know, being the black sheep, so to speak, and, and obviously no offense to Team Clark at all, but, you know, the one non-high performance team that's going to be in Omaha of the, of the seven teams, they are the one that's obviously not a high performance, you know, program. So Let's dissect some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, of being in the high performance program. And there are a lot of obvious ones, but, you know, guys, what do you think? Uh, let's start out with some of the biggest disadvantages because I do think that's, that's really where the conversation starts is you're not in the program, so you're automatically, you've got strikes against you. Is that fair? I would, I would say absolutely that's fair. One of, the, one of the biggest disadvantages and probably the most obvious is the fact that they're not in the high performance program means they don't have access to the high performance funding. And anyone who's trying to make any kind of a mark at the international level, trying to get to the trials, you need a lot of money. There's just, there's just no two ways about it. I know I've, I've spoken to Brady in the past and he's told me that his, his team's budgets for their season can push upwards of 40 to $50,000. Yeah. And that's some serious money. And, you know, they, they can sell fund, they can get sponsors, but I'd say the, the lack of access to the funding that the high performance teams get uh, is probably the most obvious disadvantage. Yeah, Sean, I would say, you know, that's probably 1A and maybe 1B might be opportunity. I mean, you know, the money sort of leads to better rankings uh, and that might lead to better opportunities and those teams in the high performance program, they get access to some events that maybe other teams don't get access to. Yeah, and, and then also, I mean, guys, the obvious, uh, I mean, right here, because talking with Brady and, and those guys, they they were honest in, in just talking them off ice. They were honest in saying, at least Brady was, we weren't sure that we were going to get in. And, you know, not being a high-performance team, you obviously look on the women's side, it's a little bit different. You know, obviously we have problems when we can't fill out a full nationals field on the women's side. But in this case, you know, the men a little more competitive, more deeper, I'd say deeper in field. But, you know, if you're not a high performance team, you know, there's some things that they're going that USA curling and the discretionary committee, when they're picking the trials teams, they're going to look past because you're not quote one of them. I think that's a fair statement, guys. It's it, on, on a, on a, I would say on a visceral level, that could be considered a fair statement. Uh, if you talk to any of the high performance powers that be, they would absolutely wholeheartedly vehemently deny that because, you know, as, as it's written in the trial selection uh, procedures, the only merits to select teams in are solely based upon, they're supposed to be solely based upon basically tour performance, tour performance, uh, national results, things like that. Um, but Honestly, if we're just dealing with, you know, let's, let's, let's call a spade a spade, straight human fallibility, yeah. human favorability, yeah. on some really visceral, almost subconscious level, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, you got this coaching staff that has these uh, these teams that they've been working with all year, coaching all year. They've been around these teams for, you know, eight, nine, ten events for two, maybe three years now. And there's a team on the outside. Yeah. It's like, well, no, of course they don't want them in there. And that that's that's just basic human sense in my mind. Yeah. Well, I think there's a, it, there's probably an investment that's felt in those teams because they spent so much time with them, but there's also the the thought that well, we picked these these teams for a reason. We think that they are they are our best athletes, they are our best opportunity to medal in these world events. And, you know, Team Lake Clark has to, had to really prove their way in, and by winning nationals 2 years ago, that was really how they sort of proved it. Um, and you know they are not a team that that has a light schedule by any stretch of the imagination. They have to go out and prove it each and every week, the same way that these other teams do. And I think that they've done that. But those those disadvantages we talked about, the money, uh, they have to find sponsors, they have to find coaching, they have to find ice and and train the the 
mental and physical training that they have to invest in to kind of keep up with the Joneses, that's a significant disadvantage. Yeah. Because it, it, it takes, it takes away from their ability to just curl, which I think is the biggest advantage that maybe those high performance teams have. So they, they have more opportunity to just curl. And by no means are those guys, um, professional curlers in that they don't have any other um, forms of income, but um, it, or that they don't have needs beyond what the high performance program provides for them. Yeah. Um, but Clark has to go further to make it even. Yeah. In, in, in one word you said right there to me, I mean, is further. And that's another disadvantage these guys have, in my opinion, because, you know, take, take even being out of the high performance uh, out of it in a way, I mean, you've got these guys that are out there in Seattle. Now, there's some opportunity locally, but it's nothing like, Sean, what you've got at the tip of your fingers there in the Twin Cities. And, you know, in terms of, you know, playing good competition almost every week or, you know, in, in different leagues. I mean, Granite Curling Club is, is, a, it was, is an outstanding, it's got a lot of history, but, you know, there's not quite the level, there's not, well, there's no quite to it. They don't have the opportunity right there locally at their fingertips, say, even if anybody in the Twin Cities does. No, they definitely don't, and that's why uh, the Clark team travels so much. Um, yeah. Like I know this year, I mean they've they've got six events on the docket, and they've already played two. I mean they played the Stu Cells tank, Tanker the first weekend of September, and they didn't yep. qualify, but they won a lot of games. And they just played another event this week, this week, this past weekend in Oakville. Yep. And they uh, they and they managed to uh, they, they finished third there. So they're just trying to keep things going, maybe playing a somewhat lighter schedule than in the past, but. It definitely, given how um, overall geographically spread out that team is, I mean, the only only Brady and Phil actually live in Seattle. Yeah. Greg lives up in Alaska. Yeah, he's got to pay. I don't even want to guess how much for every flight to come every time he's going home. And then Colin lives here in the Twin Cities, and he's actually playing in the Blaine Super League. So he probably has the easiest access to consistent, you know, continuous competition when there are not events going. And you know that kind of the, the the you know the, the term I've heard is team geographically challenged and they're only they're kind of that but they've been playing long enough that it's not that big a deal but yeah it's definitely tough for those guys to get early season competition. You know, Sean, in, in those two events that you mentioned, th- those are in Ontario. Those are not exactly those are not West Coast events. They're having to travel out here to the East Coast mm-hmm. to play in these events early in the season to get the the games in that they're going to need in order to ramp up their game for November. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, there's, uh, I mean, I know that they play a lot of, uh, they try to play some events in Alberta and British Columbia that are close to them, but early in the season, you're going to find more events in Ontario. And, you know, those guys know that they have the trials coming up and, you know, you got to go where the play is. And right now, those early season events, Ontario is where nine out of 10 of them are going to be. Yeah. And some of the other things that, that are kind of built in that maybe a lot of the, you know, novice curler, you know, doesn't recognize w- that you get with being a high performance, but you get a lot of, let's say bells and whistles, but you know, the things that you get like, you know, sports, a, access to a sports psychologist, somebody that might be, you know, around at championship events all the time, you know, personal training, uh, you know, specialized coaching and, and clinics and those kind of things. I mean, those, those kind of things, they add up and they, and they, they add up in terms of helping sometimes take a stress level off a team, by things that are just built in and are a given, you know, to the to the high performance teams, and not to say they're not appreciated, but it's just something that you know you have that you don't have to worry about that might just be considered another advantage. Right. That that feeds into what you were saying <laughs> earlier about uh, the high performance teams having all those resources and uh, you know additional benefits kind of managed for them, and they can just focus on curling. And that was that's kind of something I listed as another general disadvantage to Team Clark in this scenario is they don't have the access to other high performance program resources aside from the funding, and that includes, like you said, the sports psychology, the coaching, uh, access to you know whatever other uh, you know, resources like you know high performance the the, the camps, uh, the Olympic Training Center, that that sort of. You know, the, the the intangible stuff that a lot of us don't even think about, yeah. but can really make the difference to, you know, getting a team just that, just that little, little bit further to get 
you know, an inch above the rest of the competition to wind up on top of the podium rather than second. And, you know, and those guys do a lot of stuff on their own. I know they all spend a lot of time in the gym. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if they're engaged with sports psychology or not, but you know, that's one of those things that a lot of top teams are really pushing as invaluable. I know team Mike McEwen out of Manitoba, they've been doing that for years and they consider it an invaluable part of the game. Yeah, I think Team Holman employs a coach that's really just for that and and really nothing else. And I think that that's you know something that you're going to see more and more out there on tour. It's just it, the the mental part of the game is just so so important. And you know that as a skip of a <laughs> high level team yourself, Sean. Yeah, it's 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 everything. It absolutely is. And it was it, it was really just kind of an afterthought until I would. I would say maybe within the last 10 years or so, sports psych really started to come to the forefront, I think, as the level of the game started advancing with the presence of the Olympics. And, you know, the teams also generally started getting younger and every team was striving for an advantage. And that's that's definitely a real big one if a team decides to put in the work to uh, make it happen for that. Well, as we continue, Sean Murray, Joe Calabrese, myself, Price Atkinson. What about some of the what about some of the advantages? Uh, you know, it might be crazy to think, but there are advantages uh, of, of teams being outside the high performance program that they have. You know, you're able to you know make changes within your lineup. You know, you know self select coaches. You know, there's flexibility. Um, you know. Not as much pressure. I mean, Sean, what do you think are maybe one or two, three things, you know, what do you think are some of the big advantages to being outside the program? Well, I think it was, I think Joe referenced earlier that some of the coaches might, might look on uh, the teams that they coach and there being some level of pressure as those teams represent an investment to perform. And I would say one advantage Clark has is that there isn't that pressure from, you know, a, a paid staff of coaches that are kind of looking at you and glaring at you and saying, all right, I want results. And if there aren't results, well, somebody might get benched or swapped out or whatever. So they just have them and their own team dynamic to worry about. No outside forces, no, you know, kind of uh, elephant in the room, as it were, Yeah, looking on them, wanting to see things. And they don't, they don't have to worry about that. That's, that's one of the bigger ones in my mind. You know, and it may work out really well for for Team Park if if uh, Team Burr's uh, appeal to make the trials is unsuccessful, and and that they would be the only team outside DHBP in the event. And I would suspect that that would bring them closer together and sort of give them an us versus the world kind of attitude. And uh, I think that that's a really dangerous thing uh, for a team as capable as Park's team is. Yeah, ab- absolutely. We saw. Uh during the, t- the 2013 Nationals. I mean, Brady, Brady had a slightly different team at that time. Yeah. But he got on a run at that Nationals, and he, he, he could not miss. He could not miss a shot. And then he got to Worlds, and though they you know, didn't have the greatest run at Worlds, Brady himself was on fire. And I've played against Brady at enough mixed Nationals to know that when he gets fired up and turns it on, he is the best shot maker in the country, bar none. And if he turns it on at the Trials, the rest of the field, I better watch out. Yeah, and, there, and there's no question that very well could happen. And, you know, we're not prognosticating, but we're just looking at it because, you know, like you said, I mean, you know Brady's pedigree and what he can do, Sean. And, you know, this is a – caught up with him a few weeks ago and, and looking at the kind of shape he's in and just being around Tilker and and, and, and those guys, call it. I mean, these guys seem so dialed in, so focused, as does everybody, but these guys seem to be carrying a little bit of a a chip. I mean, they were on the ice in the Baxter, in Baxter Arena in Omaha. I mean, they literally took advantage. Every single ice time they were allotted – I was there the whole time they were. Every single ice time they were given, those guys were out there testing the rocks, throwing rocks, getting their uh, time. I mean, those guys literally used every opportunity in that arena and on that ice to become familiar with the arena, the rocks, the ice, everything. Yeah, it's, you, you can't pass up any opportunity to just just learn and it's every facility, it's every event, it's it, it's every throw. There is always, if you've been playing for two minutes or 20 years, 
with every throw of a rock on ice, there is always something to learn and something to take away and something you could be doing better. Yeah. And that goes for every player at every level. Those guys are as aware of that as anyone and they know it. And there's always something they could be doing better. You know I mean? Knowing Brady and knowing his competitive edge, he might win a game, you know, in six ends by a score of 10 to one, but he'll remember this one thing that didn't go right. You know, this one, you know, thing that he overthrew or line, the line was placed badly or was overswept or whatever. And he will work on that one little teeny thing that in the game was inconsequential, but he wants to be prepared if that comes up again. And that mindset filters down to the entire team. And you see it every time they take to the ice. Yeah, and in fairness, when I said they were, you know, they were out there every single time, you know, every single team in Omaha was, you know, this going to be competing at trials was allowed to have that same ice time. And, and in fairness, you know, the the three HP teams, those guys were heading uh, over the border, you know, to to begin competition up in Oakville, and then obviously at the first slam. So, you know, they they there were, tr- you know, travel things that, that that were in place for those guys before. Um, you know Brady Clark and those guys before they were heading up, but they I, I I just telling you I you guys have been around them more than I have. But when I talked with them and I saw those guys, I saw a team that you know Sean. I think you were the one that said it. Or maybe it was Joe, but had a chip on their shoulder. I, you could just feel it being around them. You know, and I I think one other thing that you may want to <laughs> think about here is that you know Brady is by no means old as a person. But as the as the game continues to get younger and younger, he's getting older and older. And I do. I'm not saying this is his last chance, but he, it might be his last chance. And you, I think he's treating it that way. And I think that that's um, just sh- he's he's taking every opportunity and ev- and throwing every stone, and making every note because he may not. Ev- he, it's true for all these teams, but they may never make it back to this position again. And I think that that Brady in particular realizes that and is taking advantage of it in any way he can. I, I would agree for that, and I would, I would prob- probably also extend the same thought to Greg Persinger, you know, because, I mean, I, I can't even imagine. I, I would not want to look at his credit card bills. <laughs> Let me tell you. Given the, given the expense he has to go through just to book flights from Alaska, and he's got, I think, two daughters at home. Yeah. And... Two, two young daughters who are, you know, in the process of growing up. And I'm sure it's on some level he's thinking, man, how long can I keep this up? I mean, it's, it's been, you know, three, two, two, three years of just nonstop grind. And, you know, anyone can only keep that up for so long. And I'm sure that's on, that's on both of their minds because, you know, Greg is of a, a similar age to Brady. And I mean, neither of them are getting any younger. You know, Brady has a son now. Uh, you know, Phil has a son. And, those, I'm sure those guys, somewhere it's got to be in the back of their minds. And I think the mantra of, you know, treat every competition, treat every rock like it's your last. I think most players carry that kind of attitude anyways. But on some level, it might be just a, a little more of a, of a concern or a real, reality, a potential reality for those guys. All right. Let's <clears> – <throat> excuse me, guys. Let's go ahead and pivot, um, you know, uh, kind of away from this topic. But – you know, some news out of the World Curling Congress over, over the weekend and, and last week is a lot of folks around the sport from around the world, they got together in Slovenia and, you know, some news coming out uh, there and I think probably starting with the addition of a 13th team, one additional Asia Pacific spot to the World Championship. Um, you know, thoughts on the addition of another team. What does that mean? What does that do? Well, I know for a while, uh, the idea was floated uh, to keep the field at 12, but to move one of the America's birth teams, uh, America's birth at world, that is, to Asia, because, uh, you know, the, the current arrangement at world is you have eight teams from European, two teams from the America's region, two teams from the a- Asian region. In the America's region, you basically have Canada and the United States. And, you know, I know Brazil has issued challenges to the United States for that birth, but they have yet to be successful. I don't think they've even won a game in those challenges yet. So for all intents and purposes, that has been two auto births for Canada and the United States in the world every year. And there are a lot of 
very competitive teams coming out of the Asian region. I mean, aside from China and Japan, yeah. I mean, the Korean teams are getting stronger. You've always got competitive teams from Australia and New Zealand. And it's just, it, it just seems like the, the breadth of curling is somewhat wider in Asia right now than it is in the, you know, North and South America. And so I think it makes sense to, you know, widen the field rather than simply, you know, shift, you know, shift the berth around from one region to another, just adding another team. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, it sort of seems like a no-brainer to me, too, is, that, you know, even though there's not the number of recreational curlers in those Asian Pacific uh, countries, the, high, the, the teams that are on tour seem to be performing really, really well. And um, I do think it's fair uh, for them to say, hey, wait a minute, we've got all these countries and we're, pre- we're performing well on tour and the Americas, you know, are getting basically auto births every year. Um, you know, think about this it, it, from the America perspective. Brazil would have to challenge Canada this year, and uh, because the worlds are in the United States and the host country gets uh, an automatic berth, um, I can't imagine that being ever being successful in the, in the immediate uh, or not uh, so far uh, future. Um, but you know, it, I just don't see I don't see this as a problem for anybody. Um, I do think it, it lengthens the event to some degree, and I know they made some changes to the playoff system um, as well. Um, they, they, they now have six teams in the playoffs um, instead of uh, four, and uh, there's sort of a quarterfinals with some buys and then uh, semifinals and finals, so no page playoff in the World Championships, uh, as you might see in the Briar or the uh, Scotties. All right, what about the, uh, what about the five rock rule? Uh, not starting, not this year, but next. And is the, uh, you know, master tactical shot making assassins that both you guys are, you know, skipping your respective teams. <laughs> oh, wow. and, and, and I state that with all confidence guys, but what do you, th- I mean, this seems like it's, I think it's a good idea. Um, the players seem to have embraced it, but w- what's the thought on this? You, you in support of it? Well, the, the the general thought behind it was the fact that as teams have gotten better and better at throwing accurate big weight hits, right? They've just gotten so good at clearing out guards that you know once a team is up three points, even you know they make one cross sheet double peel, corner guards gone, corner guards gone, shooter rolls out, end is over. It's a blank, and if the teams are just so stupidly good at that. That we, you know, for lack of a better metaphor, the goalpost had to be moved just a little bit. And they've they've had this, uh, they've had the fiber rule in place at the slams for a couple years now. So the elite teams are familiar with it on some level. But I I remember uh, an interview with Glenn Howard from a couple years ago when they were first trying it out, and he as much said a team's best defense is going to have to be offense. I mean, even behind, a team is going to have to be drawing. Yeah. To, to try and nullify this thing, but it's going to give teams that are down even three points a very good shot of coming back and tying games. Whereas, you know, nowadays with as good as teams can hit, a three-point lead is virtually game over. You know, I, I like this rule too, and for a few different reasons. One, I think it promotes offense. Um, you know, the the idea that you talked about just double peeling things. It, it's not a whole lot of fun when you then have six or seven rocks in a row where it's just straight hits uh, and, and rolls out, rolling out. Uh. But I, one of the reasons I really like this is it's something that can filter down to the club level in a really easy way. Um, you know, people are pretty familiar with the four rock rule and it's been around for a long time. Adding one more rock to that is something that I think at the recreational level, people can understand and deal with. Um, I know this, uh, this was unanimously approved, this, this change, and I think it was a good thing. There are probably other ideas that are out there, you know, like eliminating the tick shot in some way might also accomplish some of the same goals. But I don't think that this easy to filter down to the recreational level as a simple five rock rule is. One other thing, or Sean, you want to get in there again? I'm sorry. Well, no, I, I was just going to, uh, the only thought I had to add to it was that I, I'm not sure uh, it's going to have a tremendous impact at like the rec league club level because, yeah. You know, not a lot. Not a lot of players at the rec league club level really do a lot of peeling or or consider it. I mean, I, I so I don't. I think the effect is more felt and a little more intended for the elite level to try and you know make 
keep a few more rocks in play, uh, force teams to play more delicate shots. You know, you're going to have to wait another rock to start peeling guards. And, you know, all those seconds out there that pride themselves as being power hitters, they, they're going to have to learn how to draw all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would agree with you that it's probably a rule that's more geared towards the the high level player. But one of the things that I like about it is that you don't have to have two different sets of rules necessarily at the rec level versus uh, the high level. I mean, uh, you look at like I think bowling maybe has two different weights of pins, you know, for high level bowling. You know, I don't want to have to get to a point where we're having two different sets of rules for high level and recreational. I think that it it helps people learn the game to have the same set of rules. All right, finally, something that – now, this is the one that really kind of caught my attention, to be honest, because the World Series and curling that they announced with with basically chinese back money, a Chinese company, I, to me, this smells of nothing more than the 2022 Winter Olympics is in Beijing. We're going to do everything we can to promote the game around the country, and again – I'm all about promoting the game, whether it's at home or abroad, because spreading the game, it, it to me, is a good thing. But this, obviously, there's ulterior motives among the Chinese. They want to spread the game, draw interest ahead of the 2022 games in Beijing. Nothing more, nothing less, because four events that would be part of this World Series of curling, two of the four would be in China. Right, right, and uh, I believe uh, one of the, one of the events would be in Europe somewhere, and then the fourth, I believe, would be in the America somewhere, if I remember correctly. But yeah, it, it's uh, I'm a little curious as to what the the uh, ultimate motive of the World Series of Curling is. I mean, it sounds like a great idea on paper, and I I have to agree that it's definitely put. It, it definitely seems like it's being instituted and funded to try and you know get people thinking four years down the line, even though we have an Olympics right around the corner, yeah. you know, in just about a year here, it's definitely, the idea is to get the interest in the sport growing, growing, especially in China. But, you know, on some level, you kind of have to ask, okay, well, we already have a grand slam in Europe. You already have the curling champions champions yeah. tour. Uh, you've already got world championships. You've already got Olympics. So uh, aside from, you know, promoting and, you know, kind of, bringing the sport to new places ideally what i'm curious as to what the actual you know purpose of these events is like are they going to have huge cash prizes is there some kind of you know like like a tour champions cup you can win if you do the best at all of them do teams enter individually do countries enter how do teams qualify i'm, I'm curious as to the overall the basically the point of this kind of event yeah yeah i mean is is this going to put a lot more pressure on these national championships or these selection, you know, processes that countries have, you know, if you're the team for your country that somehow qualifies for these events and you're traveling to four additional events a year, I mean, and they have high level prizes. I mean, just puts that next level of professionalism to the game um, that, you know, I'm not sure everybody's ready for, um, to be honest. Uh, We've got, uh, you know, these high-level teams that, that play these Grand Slams um, and sort of the next-level events are sort of struggling uh, to fill fields. And so um, it'll be interesting to see how this kind of all plays out. I mean, honestly, you know, if I'm, you know, Curl Canada, I'm I'm trying to figure out how to get more than one of our, my teams into this thing because um, they probably feel like they deserve it. Um, but if I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> the Chinese, <laughs> for example, who put, a, I think it was a million dollars into this thing, um, you know, they're going to want to see uh, hefty representation from their country as well. Big week, interesting week, uh, guys. Good stuff to get into here. Um, you know, good conversation as always here on the roundtable, the Extra Extra in podcast, 12th and Sports Network, powered by Isagenics. Uh, you know, I don't know what it, what else more there is to get into, guys, but I think we kind of covered it all. Just, uh, again, you know, as we're getting this season off to uh, to a good start, got a lot of things to look forward to over here in the coming weeks. And, Sean, I believe you've, uh, you've, you've got a team together now, right? You're back on the ice uh, kind of full-time, right? Yeah, uh, sure do, more or less full-time. Uh, I was, I've got a men's team together. Uh, we're only playing a couple of events, but, yeah, I got, uh, I'm, I'm skipping. I got Matt Milky playing third. Matt Carlson playing second, Dan Rule playing lead. Uh, our first event is the uh, St. Paul Cash in uh, just a couple of weeks here. 
Hey man, you want to take on uh, the the Calabrese rink from Rochester? You want to uh, issue a challenge here? And it's, it's not much of a challenge. It's not much of a challenge, Sean. I, I, I know the guys are playing with, and uh, you guys can handle us pretty handily. So I'm, I'll just decline that uh, gracefully. Uh, but you know, I want to wish you good luck this year. You've you've helped us out a lot, uh, being sort of the voice of our network for a for a while, and uh, it would take a little time off here to get your. Uh, your game back and uh, have a lot of fun out there. Okay. Thanks. That's absolutely the plan. Just going to, just going to play and see what happens. Yeah, man. Pulling hard for Sounds you, Sean. Good, pulling hard for the angry bird team uh, to 12th in sports network all the way, no matter what happens. Well, guys, let's uh, wrap this uh, round table up. When we come back, Joe and I will tell you what's ahead next week here on the extra extra and podcast, a great interview, uh, guest interview coming up next week and a lot more. We'll tell you about it as, as well as contests right here on the Extra Extra In podcast with the 12th In Sports Network, powered by Isagenix. We'll be right back. If you're looking to buy new curling equipment, don't settle for cheap imitations. Hardline came onto the scene seven years ago and is now at the forefront of high-performance and recreational curling equipment. Hardline's ice pad is the best choice when it comes to brush heads, which is why top-ranked pros play with it, including world champions Team Gushu, as well as U.S. men's and women's national champions Team Schuster and Team Sinclair. Whether you're looking for brooms, Pro Slide Delivery Aid designed by Reed Carruthers for shoes and apparel. Take a look at Hardline and see why they are the number one choice for curling equipment. Show this sponsor your support by going to www.tesn.us and clicking on Hardline's Ice Pad logo. All right, welcome back into the Extra Extra Podcast. Bryce Atkinson and Joe Calabrese, 12th in Sports Network, having a lot of fun here on the Extra Extra Podcast, powered by Isagenics. Great conversation there with Brady Clark and Greg Persinger, just a really open, candid Brady Clark, Joe, in a way that I hadn't heard him talk before. I mean, a guy that, and certainly a team that sounds very, very focused and very, very dialed in. Yeah, I think it was a very insightful uh, interview that you had with them, and uh, I think it shows that their team is extremely confident as they're coming into this uh, particular season. They seem the most prepared that they ever have. It's got some new coaching. They've got uh, an all-off season uh, worth of work, and I think uh, you're going to see it uh, when it comes to, in November. They're going to be the most confident, prepared Brady Clark team that I think we've ever seen. Yeah, I, I really think they're poised to potentially do something very, very big there in Omaha. But just a fantastic conversation with them. Appreciate our man Sean Murray joining us here in the last segment for our weekly roundtable, getting into a, a, an array of topics. And, you know, again, just a lot of exciting news coming out of the World Curling Federation's, uh, you know, Curling Congress last week and over the weekend. You know, some exciting changes, but uh, we got some exciting things coming up here uh, next week on the Extra Extra and Joe. Yeah, we have Corey Christensen and Sarah Anderson from Team Christensen. They're going to be joining us for an interview. And uh, you know, really, you know, they're one of those underdog teams, sort of like Brady and Greg uh, uh, from on the men's side. They're on the women's side, and they're the, one of the youngest team out there. And what are their expectations? Uh, what should we be expecting from them come November? Uh, that's really the topic of conversation uh, that we'll be having uh, in the roundtable. Yeah, we'll also be joined in our uh, roundtable segment with uh, Jessica Schultz, former two-time Olympian and a friend here on 12th and Sports Network. She'll join us and talk with us on the weekly roundtable that we do. But, uh, you know, we got to thank our sponsors every single week here, Joe, uh, Isagenix, and this week Hardline, and especially our guys at uh, Dynasty Curling. Those guys, they just do an awesome job and really love those stuff. Uh, love their stuff at Dynasty. Yeah, I want to thank them again for uh, sponsoring the contest again this week. And, you know, we've got a few other things coming up on TESN uh, this week. We've got the end of summer spiel on TESN Fort Wayne this weekend, September 22nd to 24th. Uh, so they'll be streaming all weekend from Fort Wayne. Uh, October 6th to the 8th, we've got the St. Paul Cash Spiel. And so if you want to see some of these U.S. teams in action, a lot of them are going to be playing there. And uh, they're going to be streaming with commentary uh, all weekend. And then uh, 
Team Sinclair, they started their feed this past weekend. They win the Shorty Jenkins Classic. Um, we're taking, uh, you know, invitation or, uh, you know, people's requests to be interviewed on the Extra Extra End. You get ex- interviewed on the Extra Extra <laughs> End and you start winning events. Um, so, uh, but they're uh, going to be uh, streaming all, uh, all fall long and uh, leading up to the trials and beyond. So we're real excited and want to thank them for their support as well. So what you're saying is we need to take credit for the, the Team Sinclair win at the Shorty. That's what you're telling. Me, I right? mean, it's mostly them, but it's a, there's a little bit of a bump. They're calling it the podcast bump. So if you want that bump, those teams, you got to come in, got to help us out. There we go. Well, uh, you know, we've had some great feedback. Appreciate everybody that's that's gotten to us. Uh, you, me, uh, you know, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, uh, emails that we've gotten, uh, enjoying things. Hope everybody's enjoying things. It's all about our listeners. Uh, everybody can listen to us on uh, the Apple Podcast on your phone. Just search the extra, extra in. Uh, you can listen Stitcher, Google Play, and certainly, most importantly, every single week, week your homepage for curling, the 12th. Welton Sports Network is tesn.us forward slash podcast. And, Joe, that's where you sign up for our weekly contest. And we'd be remiss. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook at the 12th Inn Sports Network. That's where you're going to get tipped off to a lot of these contests and prizes we got to give away. Yeah, you follow us on 12th Inn Sports, and uh, you'll get all the uh, action all year long. Yeah, no doubt about it. And if you follow me on Twitter at Price Atkinson uh, and you on Twitter as well, you might get a little of NFL talk. And I wasn't going to let you out the door without having my bragging rights as the Panthers in, emerged victorious from a brutal, awful game set in football back decades. But the Panthers win. And now I can say, oh, Daddy, bring home the dinosaur barbecue. I'm ready to eat. Congratulations! Congratulations on that that uh, non-loss price. That's I don't even sure I can call that a win. It was nine to three. Never seen a game quite like that before uh, in, in a in a game with good weather. So uh, <laughs> I'm a little concerned about the Bills' uh, chances the rest of the year. But uh, both defenses played very strong. And uh, I'm excited to see how it all ends up this year in the NFL. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, Bills 1-1, Panthers 2-0, whoever your team is, good luck. I'm sure we probably got a lot of Packer fans listening to us right here on the Extra Extra Podcast. So let's go ahead and get out of here, Joe. Next week, got another big show. Corey Christensen, Sarah Anderson, Jessica Schultz will join our roundtable. We'll do it again then, Joe. Have a great week, everybody. Sounds good. Go Bills. Thanks for being with us on this edition of the Extra Extra In Podcast with Price Atkinson. Follow Price and the 12th In Sports Network crew on Twitter and Facebook to stay up on our weekly contests, giveaways, and guests for upcoming episodes of the Extra Extra In Podcast, powered by Isogenics.